words today? Yes. 3 verses 20 through 35. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. And when his family heard it, they went out and seized him to seize him, for they were saying, He is out of his mind. <coughs> and the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and the and by the prince of demons he casts out demons. And he called them, called them to him, and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself, and is divided, 
He cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods, unless he first binds the strong man, and then indeed he may plunder his house. Truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man. In whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an inter- eternal sin. For they were saying, He has an unclean spirit. And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. And a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother, And your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we are so thankful that you sent your son to dwell among humankind to teach us what life with you truly is and to provide the way to that life through your death and resurrection and Lord as we consider these words I pray that your spirit will teach us and guide us that we will be open to what you have to teach us so that we can be people of encouragement instead of people leading others into sin. And in your name we pray. Amen. A couple of weeks ago we celebrated Pentecost. That day is often regarded as the beginning or the birth of the church. And for 2,000 years... We have celebrated the coming of the Holy Spirit of God on that day. I think when we celebrate Pentecost and regard it as the day the, the Spirit came, we fail to see the fullness of the Spirit. The Spirit has always existed just as Jesus has always existed with the Father. There has not been a moment where God has not been in God's fullness. And with that being said, our interaction with God has changed. If we go to the beginning of our interaction with God, Scripture tells us that God created the heavens and the earth, and that the Spirit hovered over the void or the waters. The Spirit of God has always existed. The Spirit is the power of creation. We also see the Spirit in the plagues of Egypt. It was the Spirit that passed through the nation, removing life's breath from the firstborns, not protected by the blood of the Lamb. The Spirit has power to create life, to bring something out of nothing, and can take that life away. We are also shown in the book of Acts that the Spirit took the life of two disciples that lied. This aspect of of God is wild power. We cannot control or even approach it without caution. Yet on Pentecost, the spirit that took the life of the first of Egypt and the life of those lying disciples, the spirit that restored life to Christ was given to the disciples. It descended upon them like tongues of fire. I want us to respect or reflect on the creative and destructive power of the Spirit of God. And I know that's kind of a strange thing to consider, but I want us to consider that. There is a reason the Old Testament regarded the Spirit with fear. This creative force could cause death, but there were cases where the Spirit dwelled with individuals. King David is is said to have had the Spirit with him. And 
the Spirit gave Solomon great wisdom and inspired the prophets to, to write what they wrote. The Spirit gave these men great power and influence over those around them. But they didn't control the Spirit. The Spirit is a wild, chaotic force from human perspective. We, we can't control it. And a few months ago, I was listening to a, a lecture about particle physics. Yeah, I'm a nerd. I listen to things like that. And it described the quest within science to find the singular particle that makes up all of matter. Because they keep finding something smaller, something more finer that builds something else. So they keep searching and questing to find this, this singular, unbreakable particle. And to do this, they break down these larger particles in something called a particle collider. Great big machines built in mountains that spin particles around at amazing speeds and they crash together and who knows what happens after that. Science is a tool we use to explore. But when exploring these particles, some people are afraid of what they might find. When an atom is split, a massive amount of energy is released. This release of energy has been used to prove military might over nations. So as we explore these particles, some fear that we will release something even worse than the atomic bomb that will destroy the world as we know it. And they have a point. I understand their point. But this gives us just a glimpse into the chaotic, creative power of the Spirit. If the discovery of the Spirit's building blocks can release that amount of energy, imagine what the Spirit itself is capable of. I don't claim to understand anything about particle physics. I listened to that lecture and I pretty much... I didn't retain a whole lot other than, wow, they found a lot of really small particles. And I don't even know how they say that they claim them, but they, they figured it out. And I trust them because I don't want to do that, that research. But I can understand why there's a draw for those people to research that. And I also understand where the fear comes in. The spirit is a wild power. And we must approach the spirit with caution. C.S. Lewis in, in the children's classic series, The Chronicles of Narnia, illustrates Jesus as being the lion, Aslan. And when the children ask Mr. and Mrs. Beaver if it's a tame lion, the beavers laugh and say no, but he's good. I've always loved that series, and, and I've, I've read it and listened to it often because I listen to a lot of things while I work. But I do struggle with the image of Jesus as an untamed wild lion. I understand the reasons behind it, but children didn't fear Jesus. They wanted to be with him. And Lewis fans might consider me a heretic, but I think the lion image portrays the Spirit more accurately than Jesus. The Spirit is this creative and deadly force, wild and untamed, and yet it dwells within us. The theology of the Spirit is that through Christ the Spirit is tamed. Through Christ the power of the Spirit is harnessed and directed. Jesus tames the Spirit, and on Pentecost, those with Christ have access to this amazing power that rose Jesus from the grave. I say all of this in introduction because I want us to be aware of who we are interacting with. We get an idea that we can control God. And no, we do not control God. We think we understand God, but we don't even understand or even know the smallest particles God used to create all of matter. 
we're still searching for the, the basic building blocks. This is how I want us to approach today's passage. In awe and wonder and in caution. Jesus goes home and the crowd is so great that he can't even eat. I've been to some pretty big gatherings and in those gatherings, eating was never a struggle. Maybe I'm just really good at eating, but that has never been something that I had to struggle with. Which means that this room was so full that people could not eat in their traditional manner. It was a standing room only type of event. So busy that Jesus and the disciples were too distracted to even get a snack. And Jesus' family was also in attendance at this gathering. And the family looked at the crowd and they decided to seize Jesus saying, He is out of his mind. I want us to stop for a moment here. Jesus' family questioned his sanity. Maybe they were meaning that it was unwise to attend a gathering of that size. You know, who knows? Maybe they had a pandemic going on and, and that size of a crowd was just going to make everyone sick. We, we don't know what was they were questioning. Or maybe they were questioning his mental state. We are not fully told what is meant by this statement. But one thing we can glean from it is that they are concerned about his well-being. What Jesus was doing was beyond their capacity of understanding. They were simple people from the hills of Nazareth. They were not accustomed to large crowds, and they were not accustomed to one of their own members being at the center of attention within that crowd. We have all, all been in that sort of situation at some point in our lives where our family questioned what we were doing. When I first announced to my mother that I was sensing a call to the ministry, she told me that I couldn't do it. Her literal words were, I can't preach because I can't talk. She feared for my safety and my well-being because she knew who I was and who I am. She knew me. She knew my personality. She knew that in my own power I could not stand before people because it wasn't in my nature. She thought I was out of my mind. And she was right. And she was also wrong. But that's how moms can be. Jesus' actions were not the norm. So his family worried about it. We, have, we can have concern for those around us, but we should be careful with that concern. We may know them well, but even those that are closest to us are not fully known to us. We only know what they reveal to us. You may be married for 50 years, and there's still something that's going to surprise you about the person that you're married to. If we act without seeking clarity, we run the risk of making an assumption that may not be true. Jesus' family thought he was out of his mind when the reality of the situation was he was right where he needed to be, doing what he was supposed to do. They knew him, but they didn't know everything. They didn't know or understand the deepness of his call. Then we have the religious leaders. They knew God. At least that's what they thought. When Jesus came onto the scene, he did not do things the expected way. He was not educated in their systems of education, and they didn't understand how he was able to do the things that he was doing. Because they did not understand, they fell back onto what they thought they knew. And they made assumptions as well. The God of their understanding would not or could not do the things he was doing in that manner. So he must be getting his power from somewhere else. 
Jesus' family said that he was out of his mind. And the religious leaders said that he was possessed with Beelzebul. And the house was so crowded that Jesus couldn't even get something to eat. This is not exactly the best day in Jesus' life. But Jesus doesn't throw the people out of the house. Even while facing assertive accusations, Jesus continues to offer grace and truth. And he says, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then, indeed, he can plunder his house. This has been deep in my mind over this past week. At first glance, we see this as being a statement about the absurdity of the accusation that they were raising against him. And that is what it's about. But there's more to the parable, just like every parable, than what's on the surface. Jesus is also speaking about division and unity and grace. He's speaking about the wild spirit of God and our, assum and our assumptions that we contain understand and control God. Over the past few years, we have we in the church have seen great turmoil across the nation. We're not immune from those struggles. There are people within and with outside the church that want to make claims and these claims are dividing the church. These divisions come in many forms and we could probably make a list of all the divisions and fractures that we know of. And we each have our own opinion as to which statement is right and which is wrong. And we will debate and argue our position. But where is God amid that discussion? Where is God when we divide over political issues that, that don't even belong in the church? Where is God when we allow human understanding to guide us instead of the will of God? Jesus says, truly I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the children of man. And whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. This is a haunting passage. Because what is an eternal sin? And are we in danger of committing it? This is a humbling thought. And I hope that it sobers our minds a bit. We, don't, we do not tame the Holy Spirit because the Spirit comes from God through Jesus to us. And we can either, we can either follow it or not follow it. We cannot and do not control God. And every time we fail to follow the Spirit's urgings, we sin. And there's forgiveness for that. There's even forgiveness for blasphemies that we utter, because we probably uttered a few of those daily. But there's a point God draws a line. The Holy Spirit this fire that descended on the disciples on Pentecost, the spirit that, that hovered over the waters of creation to bring forth life, this spirit that gives us strength and direction can be offended to such a degree that forgiveness is no longer available. Jesus doesn't speak of this sin with the woman that was caught in the very act of adultery. He doesn't mention it to the woman at the well who had multiple husbands and was not married to the man that she was with at that time. This sin is not alluded to when Jesus goes and eats with the tax collector. Or even when Jesus speaks to Pilate during his trial. This sin is discussed when Jesus converses with the religious leaders. Like I said, it's haunting. As I thought about this, 
I was reminded of, of the vision that Peter had while he was on the tanner's roof in Joppa. And in the vision, a sheet descends from heaven, and on this sheet, every type of animal imagined was, was on that sheet. And God speaks to Peter, and he tells him to rise, kill, and eat. And Peter, in his righteousness, tells God that he has never eaten anything unclean, and he doesn't plan to start now. This happens two more times. And after each rejection, God scolds Peter and says, What God has made clean, do not call common. This vision was given to Peter to teach him that even the Gentiles were accepted into the church because through God, because God through Christ made them clean and adopted them into the promise of Abraham. Peter was perplexed by the vision. And rightfully so. Everything that he thought he knew was overturned, and he didn't understand why. The God that gave them the law and commanded them to avoid eating unclean substances was seemingly changing his mind. This is like what happened to those scribes. They didn't understand. And in their lack of understanding, they began speaking for God. They were assuming that they knew more than God. They were attempting to control the untamed spirit. This is a danger that we all face. The whole meme, WWJD, or what would Jesus do, is almost in that place. It encourages us to speak for God. And do we really know what Jesus would do? Scripture gives us a wide scope of possible reactions that Jesus might give in any situation. From spitting on the ground to make mud to smear on someone's face. I don't encourage you to do that. Or throwing tables across the temple courts. Jesus could do many things. How are we to assume what Jesus would do in a situation? We must be careful because the Spirit of God is a wild force that we can't control. We can't put words in the mouth of God, but we can think of something else. We can think, how can I honor God in this? That doesn't make it a good bracelet. There's too many letters. How can I honor God through the situation that I face? How can I glorify God even through my lack of understanding? How can I encourage those around me to consider God even though they may reject my understanding of how God wants us to live? God's Spirit will do what God wants to do, with or without our input. The Spirit of God will do things that will purposely, pur purposefully do things that will cause us to pause and consider what he's doing. This is not because God wants to trick us or even test us, but he's drawing us deeper into that mystery of who he is. The Spirit of God may bless you, heal our afflictions, give us worldly success, or the Spirit of God may lead us into a, dark, into a place that seems dark and shadow. What do we do? in that situation what do we do how can we continue to glorify God even though we don't understand this is what Jesus explained to Nicodemus in last week's passage the wind blows and you do not know where it comes from or where it's going if you are walking through a land of shadows we can remember where that wind has been and that can give us encouragement in our lives. Or we can hold tight to that and continue to walk in faith. And when the Spirit leads us to seasons of plenty, praise Him. And when we are in the clouds of unknowing, let us not put words in the mouth of God, but instead let us seek Him more fully, asking what God could be showing us in this place and among these people. How is God revealing himself through this? 
and how can I embrace him more fully? We live among many distractions and divisions. We live in a time of history where people long for something to believe. We see it all around us and we're tempted to speak. But let us be careful with our words as we live our lives of faith. Sin can be forgiven, and even blasphemies will not be held against us. But when we speak for God and reject what the Spirit is doing, we're playing with fire. As we enter into this time of holy expectancy and open worship, let us embrace the Spirit and all of its amazing, raw, wild power. And let us chase after that wild wind and live the love of Christ with others.